1943, there were 25,000 POWs in the United States. By the June of 1945, at the end of the war in Europe, there were 425,000. In Michigan, the summer of 1945, the population peaked at 6,000 German POWs. The last to leave Fort Custer left in July of 1946. Many of these men, as we see here getting off a ship somewhere on the East Coast, uh, were automatically given what were, what were called theater codes, which meant that they had a seven-digit number, the first meaning what, standing for what theater they were, they were found in, what country then with, a, with an initial, and then their own identification number. So a POW given the number 81G-5379, 81 meant he was captured in North Africa, G he was German, and that his number of processing 5379 meant he was the number that had gone through the line on that day. The ride over here um, before the end of the war could take as much as three to six weeks. Going home in 1946 on average took six days. Why would that be? Why is it make a difference? U-boats. U-boats, things going on in the Atlantic. Um, but you can get some idea of how crowded these ships were. Here you've got your MCs up here watching them. Uh, when it came to work in uh, to work itself, officers, German officers could not be made to work in POW camps. Non-commissioned officers can only be made to supervise. The average rate of pay was 80 cents a day as per the records or rules of the Geneva Accords. Lieutenant, or, Lieutenant officers earned $20 a month. Generals were paid $40 a month. Um, the figure was arrived at because of the start of the war in the United States in 1941, the average private was paid $21 a month. So there was an attempt to try and, try and treat the Germans in a way that you hope the Germans would treat Americans on their side uh, in Europe. That's one of the ways that the Army thought. This is actually a personnel record, which is off the, off the, goes off the screen here. But, uh, I have not seen one of these filled out, so this might have been in theory only. This was actually created in 1942, this is from the National Archives, and it's a detailed handprint, right, print, uh, right hand print, finger, or fingerprints, information on a POW. I doubt whether these got this, this in form or this formal by the end of the war. Uh, there's yet, I've yet to see a lot of evidence for this in the National Archives, so it might have been just the Army planning as to how they were going to treat POWs. These gentlemen that are in line getting off the ship have the sign right here, you can't quite see it, but they're being told what items are going to be confiscated once they get past the barrier. They're being told what items cannot go um, once they're processed. Only four states in the, in, the, in the United States did not have POWs, Vermont, Montana, North Dakota, and Nevada. Um, the first POW arrivals came in October 1943, they came in South, came to Southwest Michigan, and they came to work on the grape crop. Carroll was the first in the Michigan community to have POWs, and they worked in the sugar beets. As I told my students this morning, uh, this is the big way to move POWs inland in 1943 and 44. It is to get on a train and be shipped in. Most of those that end up in Michigan come through Camp Grant, Illinois. Um, and one historian, Arnold Kramer, who's kind of the dean of POW, uh, POW history, says that a lot of these men, once they got on the trains, couldn't believe, one, how nice America looked, and two, how well they were treated once they got on a train. So this is the way the Army transported men across the interior. This is a tag that was supposedly used in, uh, in Europe when these guys were caught and uh, captured. Again, how, how much this, how well that was practiced, I don't know. This was created in 1942 when the government was first thinking about how they were going to handle the idea of POWs inside the United States. Um, Fort Custer, which this is not, this is, a, this is actually somewhere on the East Coast, but Fort Custer was the base camp for POWs in Michigan. There are two types of camps. We have base camps, we have side camps. Uh, Elmo would have been considered a side camp, as was Mount Pleasant Freeland. That meant that at the end of harvest in November uh, or early December, all POWs are shipped back to Fort Custer for the winter. And the following spring, uh, it's planting and need arises, then they're shipped back to, into areas uh, where the Army deems that they're needed, where farmers or workers need them. 
Uh, 26 prisoners of war died in Fort Custer, and I'll show you a slide at the end. Uh, 16 of these uh, were killed in, on Halloween 1945 when a truck crossed in front of a railroad track and killed uh, all those who were on board the truck. And these 26 are still, uh, you can still see the markers, uh, Fort Custer Cemetery. 14 escapes were recorded in Fort Custer area. Most of these were walkaways. The average in the state of Michigan, according to Fort Custer records that I saw, the average walk, walk away lasted about two days. Sometimes it was a couple hours, sometimes a little bit longer than that. Uh, the longest and probably the most shocking took place in Dundee, Michigan, when a pair of POWs hopped aboard the NNW Railroad and rode it all the way to Roanoke, Virginia, 18 days later, where they were found starving when the boxcar was opened and they were surprised uh, by workers in the railroad. That was a rare exception. Most of these guys that walked away walk away because they're discouraged, um, they're out for adventure, uh, they're just not a lot of places to go. So they're usually rounded up within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, resistance by POWs, again looking at Fort Custer, uh, what would a POW do to resist? Well the ultimate would be a strike. Usually strikes don't last too long at Fort Custer because the men have to eat. And that was one way that the Army got their attention. Um, smaller instances of resistance like painting a swastika on a turtle and turning it loose in the compound, or being given the job to plant flowers and then sowing the seed in the image of a swastika, of which it would come up a couple weeks later, was usually the norm as far as resistance in the camp at Fort Custer. Um, one thing I did find, let me say a word about this, this is an image you'd see inside camps. And I'll show you some other, we'll, we'll look at Mount Pleasant and Owasso. The peak tent is usually what people remember about site camps. And again, these are camps that are going to be set up in the summertime and they're going to be disassembled by the time the harvest is over with. Except for in Elma, where they're kept in the warehouse at the sugar beet factory. Um, this is an image that many people remember to communities. I've seen some people in Owasso who remember smaller versions of this, POWs being sent out to the fields. Uh, waving to people and people wondering do we wave back or not. In some cases they did. Uh, but you can see most of the expressions on their faces, they're not too upset. Uh, POWs in America generally uh, were in the land of milk and honey. Uh, as compared to being in a gulag or being in a Soviet prisoner war camp, it was the opposite day and night to be here. And uh, were treated very well, I think. This is a site you might have seen in Gratiot County. Uh, it's not from the county, but it's one you would see. Here these gentlemen are taking their break, but here you have the guard with his gun in the background. This is another shot taken outside of Fort Custer. These prisoners were allowed to um, actually farm or work on a large garden. I think it was about 15 or 20 acres. And I think that's spinach, but I'm not sure. But that is what's coming up there. It's not a sugar beet. But they're out harvesting in the fall. And you can see that these guys are tagged. And one way a POW would get that off was to get his hands on some kerosene. If he could, he might be able to get the paint off the back of his jacket or off his pants. But usually you've got a tag on the back and usually on the legs on the front. Or you can see them right here. Um, life in a camp. Um, also fe featured their own, or like I told the kids this morning, it was a PX. Um, they're paid 80 cents a day. They did have a, uh, at Fort Custer um, accessibility to different things they could buy, including beer, which usually the limit was two bottles of this half beer that the Army supplied, which they had to pay for. Um, they also could write home. This is a postcard uh, set for Fort Custer. has been stamped here. The, you see the Nazi symbol here, sent back to Württemberg, Germany, written, this is June 28, 1944. What does it say? Dear sister, I would like you to bring, I would like to bring you cheer and let you know that I'm doing well. How are you and your dear Paul? I just wish that you're on the up. What's Otto doing? Is he still on the right? Uh, greetings to all relatives. Cordially yours, your brother. Um, this is in Bridgeton, New Jersey. This is an exception rather than a rule. Probably this is a base camp 